Good afternoon. I am really um, quite delighted to be here. Um, it's an exciting conference and especially honored to introduce my friend um, and colleague, uh, Jennifer Morgan, someone who I adore as a person and someone whose work has been crucial, central to my own development as a historian, um, and in particular, my work on enslaved women. One of the true pleasures of the work we do in the academy is the chance to speak to the importance of a scholar's work by way of an introduction to a talk. What makes this immensely pleasurable for me is that while I will repeat some things about Professor Morgan that are widely known, it is nonetheless a wonderful chance to express my appreciation for the work that she does work that insistently demands our attention and rewards that attention, work that says, just follow me and I will take you places you have never been before, places you have only dreamed of, work that says, I will show you people you have not seen before, not because they were invisible or because the archives are silent, not because they were considered unimportant at the time they lived, but because scholars in the past have deemed them unimportant. Morgan asked that we question what we thought we knew, and she gives us new ways to think about, to consider what we do not know. In her terrific body of work, Professor Morgan has given us a platform, a platform on which to build new ways of seeing and knowing. But she doesn't simply <clears throat> come bearing new knowledge in the process, she challenges us and challenges the very foundation of what we thought we knew. Her work is a critical component of the larger project of historians that is changing the way we think about history, about the archives, and about Black people. It has begun to make more legible the really complex lives of enslaved people, what they thought, how they acted, and particularly how they acted under the constraints of enslavement in a world in a society dedicated to the perpetuation of slavery. And in that dedication to an investment in the bodies of black women who have to be, who have to be at the center of our work on enslavement and US history. By centering women, she notes in an interview, quote, we get to the heart of the system of racial slavery. We get to the claim that the body is a site of commodification and the production of race as a legible sign of provenance. Studying black women's experience, she tells us, their experience of enslavement and freedom enable us to make visible some of the ideological processes by which the entire history of capitalism was subtended by the hereditary mark of enslavement, end quote. This is work, important work, that reminds us that Black women's bodies are key, that Black children were always enslavable. It is work that takes us to see women considered mad for resisting the reproduction of racial capitalism to see that they were not mad at all. In revealing how expectations regarding gender and reproduction were central to racial ideologies, central to the organization of slave labor and the nature of the enslaved community, Morgan's work has challenged conventional wisdom. In the end, of course, it makes sense. It makes sense because as human beings, we know that slavery was an unnatural predicament. We call the kind of work Morgan does signal, path-breaking, groundbreaking. In the case of Morgan, this is not idle gossip. Her work remaps the past and the present. It is concerned with the ideas and ideologies that drove enslaved women's actions and their politics and the records that they left of their politics. Robin Kelly observed, I quote, the relative invisibility of black women in discussions of radical freedom is a matter of conception or the way in which the interests and experiences of black people are treated. In her new book, Morgan takes on the problem of conception in brilliant fashion.
linking the question of racing populations or differentiation to the realms of political economy and demographic science and black women's bodies. Thus, at the very moment she writes of the infamous law passed by the Virginia House of Burgesses declaring that children born to English men and African women would follow the condition of the mother. At that very moment, the demographer, William Petty, <clears throat> was writing that English planters are encouraging or advising English planters to put Indian girls under seven years of age and use them, to take them and use them as wives. Embedded in the rationalist turn, Morgan tells us towards discourse about demographics and population was a degree of dehumanizing violence. It is not only the depth of her research, the originality of her thinking, and the analytical precision that draws us to her work. It is also her ability to absorb what the archives tell, even when they tell us unintentionally, and to render those stories in a way that give them meaning in a riveting, in riveting prose with such memorable sentences as this, quote, slavery destroyed, exploited, and remade kinship. Among the enslaved, though a contradictory, through a contradictory claim about African women that they birth strangers or property rather than kin, we are left with the weight of the speculative possibility that enslavers saw on the bodies of Black women the accounting, as she writes, the reckoning now and then. Jennifer Morgan is a professor of social and cultural analysis and history at NYU. She's the author, as I've described, of path-breaking work. Her book, Laboring Women, Reproduction and Gender in the New World, published in 2004, taught us things we could not have imagined before. She is co-editor of Co Connections, Histories of Race and Sex in America. She is the author of numerous field-defining articles, and most recently, the author of Reckoning with Slavery, Gender, Kinship, and Capitalism in the Early Black Atlantic, a study of colonial numeracy, racism, and the rise of the transatlantic slave trade in the, in the 17th century. <clears throat> Morgan also serves as, as the council chair for the Omon Hundro Institute for Early American History and Culture. And she's past vice president of the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians and a lifetime member of the Association of Black Women Historians. This introduction finally would be, would be incomplete without noting that she is a proud graduate of Oberlin College uh, where she had contact with a now famous woman, Adrienne Lash, um, famous due to uh, Jennifer's um, talking about her on more than one occasion in her writing and the impact um, Lash Jones had on her. She received her PhD from Duke um, in the history department here, where she had the wonderful experience of being here at the same time as Julia Scott. While a graduate student at Duke, she co-founded the um, Hurst and James Society, the first Black graduate, uh, graduate student association at Duke. And so it is with special pleasure that I join you in welcoming Jennifer back to Duke and to Durham, where her mother's family has lived for generations and played an instrumental role in the history of the city, including the founding of North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Thank you. That doesn't seem adequate, but thank you. That was the most extraordinary introduction that I think I've ever um, had the honor of receiving. So thank you, Favolia. Um, thank you, Jocelyn, and everyone at the Feminist Theory Workshop for the generous invitation to share my work with you. The last time that I stood in front of an audience in the before times was February 29th, 2020, here at Duke in a symposium I organized it to honor the work of my advisor and mentor, Julia Scott. Julie has taught me to see the intellectual and political contours of the Black Atlantic in ways that fundamentally shaped the field 
my career, and frankly, my life. I've always brought his lessons about the liberatory potential of doing Black history to bear on my work on the early histories of Black women. Julius died a few months ago, and the gathering to honor him here in 2020 at the time was emotional. It's made more emotional recently in light of his passing. And I find myself feeling echoes of that emotion today, being here um, back gathering in person with colleagues and students uh, in ways that has eluded us for some time. So, uh, sorry, I still need to gather myself. Um, I wanna talk to you today about my approach to the early modern archives of race and slavery. And I want to do so through the stories of three women who managed to touch those archives, to leave a mark that indicates that they were there. For those of you who have read Reckoning with Slavery, you will recognize these stories, but I hope to do more here than simply repeat them. As I find myself engaging with students and colleagues about the book, I've been thinking increasingly about how my arguments are rooted in claims concerning interdisciplinary feminist methodology and what it means to deploy that methodology to write the history of people who elude the archives. I've also been thinking about what it means to mount a criticism of siloed knowledge production while still ultimately dwelling in the discipline and the disciplinary location of the historian. And finally, I've been pondering the effect of my effort to claim these women as critical historical subjects at a time in our current crisis when doing so feels simultaneously dangerous and mundane. Grappling with the afterlives of slavery, its reverberations in the black maternal mortality crisis, in the onslaught of right-wing anti-abortion legislators who seem to have drawn directly on the Fugitive Slave Act in authorizing the criminalization of women who flee a state in order to obtain healthcare. And finally, the ongoing war in Ukraine, which is magnified in its horror by the shock expressed by so many that war has descended on civilized Europeans. There is so much violence. There is so much that is so pressing. And yet, I think that there's something, something in these stories, something in these traces. A year after the 2007 publication of Lose Your Mother, Saidia Hartman revisited the story of a girl or two girls violated and murdered aboard a slave ship and offers us a compelling rumination on the location of enslaved women in the histories of the Atlantic world. Here she joins a cohort of scholars, myself included, Pavolia Glimpf included, um, Aisha Finch included, and many others, um, who have begun to mount an argument about the foundational role of hereditary racial slavery um, in the onset of the modern world. We argue that in the space of the reproductive potential of African women, Europeans produce a conceptual shift that reverberates like a sonic boom, authorizing land and resource grabs, racializing both labor and freedom, legitimizing an economy rooted in forced extractions, situating African women as making commodified population, not kin. Hartman challenges us to do more than recount the violence that deposited traces in the archive, um, but to embrace research projects in which affect becomes an analytic tool. And so she asks us to consider what it means to write women back into the violences of enslavement, to center the erasures, the obscenities, the palpable shit and blood, the tears and the stench as we begin our journey towards telling stories in dark times. In my work, these are stories of women who used the tools at their disposal, tools of baptism and apprenticeship, of freedom papers conferred by colonial assemblies, of an unflinchingly leveled gaze to stave off the inevitability of their children's precarious futures, to make kinfulness. Women whose strategic decisions and analysis of power were more than the fragments and scraps of the archive and whose recovery speaks to the malaise of being unable to speak their names and to the, uh, to the unintended, cons uh, sorry, and to the unintended possibilities of trying to speak their names the possibilities of claiming their presence, of resituating them in a narrative that in the narrative that the archives always already intended to thwart, and thus um, the possibilities of comprehending the many headed hydra of dispossession authorized in their unnaming. 
In Reckoning with Slavery, I explore the intersecting material and ideological arenas of commerce, race, kinship, and refusal in the early modern Atlantic. Doing so required a capacious methodological approach rooted in black feminist praxis, one in which, as I hope to offer you a glimpse of here, um, uh, out of the, mm, one in which, sorry, one in which the production of sources is as central as the story that the sources tell, which is of course just good history writing. Um, but it's also an approach that grapples with the way that the opacity of the sources production is crucial to the deployment of power that situates these women as unnamed and unaccounted for. So this afternoon, I'm gonna use the story of these three women as a way to anchor an introduction of sorts to the larger questions that continue to haunt me. Broadly speaking, those questions concerns ideas of value, kinship, and refusal. Sometime in the years before 1585, in the town of Bologna, a woman sat for a portrait painted by a man who would become famous. As you can see in the portrait, she is dressed well and she holds an ornate clock that may indicate the kind of wealthy household of which she was a part. The painting was damaged, so we do not know who else was in the portrait, only that at one point she was not alone. She stands behind another figure, one presumed to also be a woman. In that regard, it seems logical to conclude that she was in this portrait in order to mark the wealth of the family who are occluded by the damaged canvas. She, like the clock, signifies luxury. If you look closely at the bodice of her gown, you will see straight pins. She may or may not have pinned herself into the gown. She may or may not have sewed the dress and the decorative collar she wears. She may or may not have been a seamstress. She may or may not have been paid for her labor. She may or may not have been free. Hundreds of Africans were enslaved and free in Italy at the end of the 16th century. At the time she was painted, the Mediterranean world had been home to enslaved Africans for almost 150 years but art historians don't know who this woman is. Apparently, at least for now, they can't. Because there was, as early as 1585, apparently no need to archive such an insignificant fact as the name of an African woman, a member of a household, a person sitting for hours for a portrait in a prominent painter's studio into the historical record. And so instead she is referenced rather than named, referenced, referenced with language that actively participates in her racialized objectification. Slave woman with a clock, black woman with a clock, African woman with a clock. A processual march of identifiers that again say nothing about her, but everything about us. She marks time with the object that she holds, but she marks so much more time with the gaze that holds the viewer. And it is here that I pivot, that I speculate. And I do so because for me, her face conveys nothing if not knowing. She knows who she is in relation to the painter. She knows what she sees. She locks eyes with the viewer. The turn of her lip seems dismissive, dismissing perhaps our question as to who she is. When I look at her, I find myself in the grip of a woman who gazes out across the centuries to say, look at me. I know what brought me here. I see someone who understands her own value, both the value that can't be quantified and that which can. I see someone with a deep understanding of who and where she is. The scholarship on women and slavery is rooted methodologically in the earthy loam of social history. This carries with it a presumption that a study of gender and slavery is by default a study of affect, of pain, of resilience, of the minute pleasures of movement or coiffure or a beribboned frock, or of the desperation of trying to protect a child or of the terror of the auction block, the toll taken on the body by the frenzied harvest of sugarcane, the incessant pounding of rice, or the stooped trudge down a row of cotton plants the degradation of a mistress's violence and her chamber pot. These are all real, no doubt. But there is something missing from the production of these women in our historical memory and not only all that would fill in the social historical gap that separates Phyllis Wheatley from Harriet Tubman. It's a gap that fails to ask questions about analytics, about ideology. It's a gap that presumes that women's experience of enslavement is entirely corporeal, injured and disoriented. There's little in the way of situating enslaved women of African descent as at the heart of a process of knowledge production, 
of crafting meaning out of the structures of value in which they were embedded and thus which they became part of defining. If we are looking to understand, as I am, uh, the ways that new comprehensions of value, of anti-mercantilism, of the transition from the feudal to the early modern economic systems are made tangible, then those who are at the heart of the alchemy of the perverse ideological maneuvers that imagined Black women perpetually delivering speculative capital through their birth canals, then we need to look to them for theories of value that were mobilized to stave off the violence embedded in racial capitalism. The exclusion of early modern Black thought from the roots of economic theory seems to me to be nonsensical. To do otherwise seems so simple, and yet, in the words of Jamaica Kincaid, when ruminating over the connection between the slave trade and the Jamaican tourist industry, there's a world of something in this, but I can't get into it right now. Instead, instead to find the figure of the knowing woman, we turn to sources that are literally designed to keep her obscure. The accounts of so-called travelers, the edicts of royal rulers declaring their lands to be no home to blackamoors. There's also the work of decorative art that mobilizes these very men and women as proof of the worth um, of luminescent white skin. This is a scant arsenal in the face of all that keeping her obscure enables. This is not working. There we go. There, leave it there for just a second. Um, uh, this is a scant arsenal in the face of all that keeping her obscure enables. For some, the silences that these sources produce are so powerful that they convince us that we cannot do this work. We cannot bring her into focus because that loamy earthiness that we need so as to access a social history is utterly missing from the account books, the ledgers, the inventories and bills of sale, or the stylized images in which we are far more likely to find this woman, her children and her sistren. From these records, we can clearly see uh, these black women and men in, early, but from those records, pardon me, the, the account books, those other kinds of records, we can clearly see these black women and men in early modern Europe, beginning with the first sub-Saharan African person who was a woman who was enslaved and transported to Europe by European traders taken in a Portuguese raid in 1441 at the Rio de Oro in Senegambia and leading to some 10,000 captives or more who over the course of the period of the transatlantic slave trade would survive this kind of voyage into Europe. Africans were enslaved in Europe from the very beginning. My interest here is not in the long history of Africans in Europe per se, but rather it is in the accumulated knowledge that those captives brought to the economic and social system that was built around and through their presence and that of those enslaved in Europe's Atlantic colonies. So what does she know? How can she know? Um, she knows because she's living in Italy, not on the Mediterranean Ocean, of course, but um, sea, but only 100 miles away in the context of a surge of commercial networks that are part of what sparks Genoese and merchants to think about financial instruments and not just currency. She and the women like her in Florence, Genoa, Bologna, and Livorno were evidence of the changes in theories of value that were rippling across Mediterranean Europe in the 16th century to presume that she and they had no comprehension of or impact on those processes is in my view absurd. Further, the record of the slave trade and of the commerce at its heart are part of a technology of knowledge production that situates trade and racial slavery as rational and that excludes women's lives from the purview of the archive. Now we know that women as producers and reproducers have been at the heart of Atlantic slavery from its inception. Because of their capacity to birth the wealth associated with the slave trade, they brought a critical comprehension of the depth of violence embedded in hereditary racial slavery, even as it only slowly for some cohered. I'm arguing here and throughout my work that this clarity of awareness is at the heart of what we are currently thinking of as racial capitalism and the roots of the black radical tradition. And that the, and that's drawing obviously on Cedric Robinson and that the erasure of these women's critical understanding of what was being wrought through their bodies is, um, and, and is, is a key and still profoundly under theorized aspect of the history of the black Atlantic. 
racial capitalism, as you all know, is um, argues that the roots of capitalism are inextricable from those of slavery, and that the inequities of slavery actually are the fertile ground for the appropriation of value that follows. The gaze of the woman from Bologna, I am convinced, conveys all this and more. It conveys her own awareness of how she is being positioned, and the painter's ability to capture that knowingness is a provocation to all of us, I think, to ask what it is precisely that she might know. Move it. Thank you. The second woman I would like to talk about is Elizabeth Key, um, whose story causes me to think about kinship. Elizabeth Key, she's the only one of the three who's named, by the way, um, was a black woman who lived in colonial Virginia in the 17th century. She was the daughter of an Angolan woman who arrived in Virginia in 1619 or possibly 1620. It's a better story if she came in 1619. It's, I, I just need to say it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to nail it down. Um, but she was the daughter of a woman who arrived in Virginia in 1619 or 20, along with the 20 or so other captives sold there to inaugurate North America's long history of slavery built on the destruction of black futurity. This unnamed woman found herself pregnant at the hands of the Englishman who purchased her. Nothing further is known concerning the nature of their relationship, but we know that it produced a daughter, Elizabeth, whose efforts to navigate the, who, whose efforts to navigate the complicated racial terrain of the Virginia colony became associated with a crucial piece of colonial legislation that cemented the connection between reproduction and hereditary racial slavery. Now, Elizabeth's father was a man named Thomas Key, a married landowner and member of the House of Burgesses who, who died after returning to England during her girlhood. Before he departed the colony, he would placed her in an indenture and indicated his desire for her to be educated and treated as a free Christian woman. This is important as it became part of Elizabeth's freedom claim as an adult. Her status also as Key's daughter was never a secret. It was widely known that this young woman's father was not only a free Englishman, but a free Englishman of some um, status and economic mobility. But her relative freedom pinned as it was to a transgressive paternity that increasingly muttered the waters of property rights was insufficient. She was clearly in danger of being enslaved. And indeed, after his death, she or her indenture was sold to another Virginia landowner now, selling the remaining terms of an indenture was not uncommon, but because Elizabeth Key was the daughter of an African woman, her race made her vulnerable. 17th century Virginia is often treated not as a site where race is clearly demarcated, but rather as a site of racial indeterminacy. Although they embraced the system of African slavery elsewhere in the Atlantic, in the first half of the 17th century, the English in Virginia primarily re relied on white indentured servants. In the 1650s, there were fewer than 300 Africans in the colony or about 1% of the total population of English settlers. Among them were uh, black men and women like Anthony and Mary Johnson, who were both landowners and slave owners themselves and whose histories have stood as testimony to the complicated terrain of the early Chesapeake. Elizabeth's own trajectory too has been read to indicate a kind of racial fluidity her freedom suit, an example of the willingness of Englishmen to concede the prerogatives of freedom across the color line. But I see something quite different. Elizabeth understood that she was in danger, that her color could in fact dictate her status. When I look at Elizabeth Key and see what she sees, I think something else is made clear and it comes into focus through kin, through the family that she was born into and the family that she was in the process of creating. In 1655, in her mid-20s and a new mother, Elizabeth Key petitioned the court and then the legislative body for her freedom. She thus became the first woman of African descent to do so in the North American English colonies. She had a precise understanding of the dangers that surrounded her as a result of the interrelated consequences of race and sex in colonial Virginia. She had by then been transferred to a third Englishman whose executors listed her and her son among his Negroes, not his servants. She had by then been held for at least 10 years longer than the term of the 1636 indenture had specified. In other words, she had by then experienced intimately and firsthand the presumptions attached to her maternal inheritance, an inheritance that exposed her to a vulnerability that her paternal line should have protected her from. 
Historians are also accustomed to thinking about Elizabeth Key as a woman enmeshed in social relations, not as a person who was an economic thinker, a person versed in political arithmetic or speculative thought or social calculation. And yet economic concerns were precisely the source of danger for Key. And indeed economic concerns drove the legislators to revisit this case less than a decade later. The colonial legislators reconvened, <laughs> thank you, um, to, uh, uh, to decree that in all future cases, the condition of a child born to an African woman and a free man would follow that of the mother, whereas some doubts have arisen, it says. As English colonial settlers legislated new economic formulations that extended master's property rights in other, um, in other human beings, they brought matters of intimacy and affect out of the household and into the marketplace. They confined Africans and their descendants to ledgers and to bills of sale, not to households and families. This social transformation was saturated with both spectacular violence and the brutalities of, the brutalities of everyday cruelties. Ones that Elizabeth um, and her husband, William Grinstead would circumvent through an escape that would lead them across the color line where ultimately her descendants would find themselves in the decades that followed. So inheritance, kinship, how did enslaved Africans who endured the Middle Passage produce and reproduce notions of relatedness from the devastation of severed kin ties, from the state which Hortense Spillers described decades ago as kinlessness? How do freedom claims stem from or indeed produce claims of kinfulness? If making kin differently is at the heart of a feminist response to the Anthropocene, then looking to those who experienced the foundational transmutation of kin into population should, I argue, be at the nexus of where we look for the possibilities um, at the heart of Donna Haraway's call to make kin. Elizabeth Key's entry into the colonial court is, among other things, a critique of the abstractive violence of population a concept that first appears in the English Atlantic in the 1660s as a matter of political arithmetic that coincides not at all incidentally, I argue, and as Professor Glimpf gave you a preview of with the rise of the transatlantic slave trade. You may recall that Saidiya Hartman mobilized the concept of political arithmetic to access the afterlife of slavery, um, the economizing of life as Michelle Murphy goes on to elaborate. I attend to the origins of the term political arithmetic, which emerges in the mid 17th century to describe the nascent field of political economy. As the English began to embrace the slave trade, 17th century political theorists hit upon the concepts and tools of demography, census and population to suggest that human beings were not in fact defined by their relationship to the land, but rather by their abstract value to the king. Such a maneuver, I argue, is only rendered plausible in the face of the logics of racial slavery, of nation building on the back of stolen men and women cultivating stolen land. Ultimately, all of this is rooted um, in questions that, that I am constantly <laughs> Picking at, um, how might the actions of women like Elizabeth Key illuminate her own clarity about the encroaching logics of racial slavery? How much did she know about the tide of racial slavery that was engulfing the Atlantic world? She certainly knew enough to act decisively in an effort to protect herself and her children from the claims that she should be enslaved. Her enslavement was made manifest in the disavowal of some of her kin ties and in the recognition that she was passing the mark of enslavability to her son. Reproduction was the vehicle through which these ideologies were conveyed. And she recognized on some level that she was embedded in racialized structures of meaning and labor. Her freedom was not assured despite her father's prominence. When faced with the instability of her son's future, she came to understand that her ties to her child could be his own destruction through the economic logics of racial slavery. In this regard, she was of course prescient. The child of an African woman whose freedom and that of her children were dependent upon English men, Elizabeth may not have understood the role that her case would have in propelling the 1662 legislative act, but she did understand that the atmosphere in which she lived was one that put her and her kin in jeopardy. 
The forces that moved Key and the father of her children in and out of court were precisely those that anticipated both her vulnerability and that of all black women in a nascent slave society. The 1662 disavowal of her freedom claim presaged the reality that legally sanctioned claims to lineage for black Virginians were exceptionally short-lived. Her court case sounds to me like an echo of the expression on the face of the woman with a clock, a challenge to the historian sitting at a desk a lifetime away to actually see her and to ask what it was that she knew. Oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> In 1683, the English ship Dorothy arrived at the Ghana coast and over the course of many weeks, slowly was loaded with 135 men and women. This is the story of the last woman. The ship had anchored at six spots along the coast since arriving. Its journey ended off Elmina. At each anchoring, it had traded for Negroes, gold dust and elephant teeth. English slave ships off the coast of Ghana would have been filled with captives who had themselves already endured weeks or months in one of the forts that dots the coast. Groups of men and women whose time in the dungeons would have already begun to teach them lessons. Women who would witness them, the, their sistren or endure themselves being pulled from the dungeon up a set of stairs that leads directly to the governor's quarters they understood something about the way in which their bodies, sick, exhausted, covered in filth and weeping, would be marked and claimed, raped and returned to the dungeon. They would, have, they would have, while at the ship's final anchor, already begun to construct an understanding of the endlessness of their ordeal, the depths of their despair, and the role of their bodies at the hands of white men. And I think that the, the, the architecture of the forts is really, really crucial here, and the way that there is this physical planned access between female dungeons and the governor's quarters. This is not accidental, and it uh, repeats along the coast. Now, also during the time that the ship remained at anchor, the captain was unable to stop the captives from using tobacco. He likely thought it was a harmless concession originally, especially because, uh, because other ship captains allowed it. And in fact, tobacco had been distributed to captives on board English ships beginning in the first half of the 17th century as the crop and its use made its way from Virginia. The sight of a woman smoking a pipe was not unusual. Um, travelers to West Africa circulated images like this one, which is of Queen Nzinga, um, which, was, which was painted around the same time as the Dorothy's voyage. Although perhaps the woman in my story was thinking back on something more mundane and comforting um, as she smoked on board that ship from which she could see the shore that she would never again step foot on with a child at her back. What happened on, the, on board that ship stops me dead in my tracks. Quote, a Negro woman between deck of the said ship who had fire with her did fling the same pipe lighted from her which did fall into the hole of the said ship where the gunpowder was and instantly the ship thereupon was blown up. News of what happened on board this ship comes from the testimony in England's Admiralty Court over who was ultimately at fault for the explosion that sunk the ship, killed all of the captives and many of the crew. One of the details gleaned from the case is that the gunpowder on board the ship had been loaded and reloaded, moved from one area of the ship to another during the course of the time spent at the coast. And so she, the pipe smoking captive, her contemplating smoking captured the eye of a crew member who survived the explosion and recalled her actions, peering through the dark at the embers at her lips in a silence perhaps broken by the lap of waves and the moans emitting from the men chained below deck he managed to see her last act. She flung that pipe. She did so with or without accounting for what the other captives chained below deck thought or hoped about their future. But as she flung it, flung it she forced them into a kind of kinship with her. And both he and she watched the burning ember fall down into the below deck hold where she had seen that the gunpowder had been stored. Now, a handful of Englishmen survived and testified to the care that they had always taken to keep the powder safe. Their story was crafted to indicate her carelessness, to, to excuse, to um, exonerate the survivors, and of course, to issue a warning to the captains of other ships. 
The case takes up pages and pages of testimony concerning the ship's orders, its route, its cargo. The woman who holds my attention is mentioned in a single line of a long and rambling document, a document designed and archived to do the work of protecting the rationalizing precepts of the trade in human cargo, a document whose form, structure, and rhythm attest to nothing more urgently than the need to keep her out of the equation. But she demands our attention. She is an eruption. She demands a methodological strategy in which she is centered, in which she emerges out of the archival noise designed to destroy her in full possession of the noise she created off the coast of Elmina as the ship exploded. And of course, the crucial question is, was her act carelessness or care? Her own calculations are of course utterly lost to us, but we can speculate. She had already survived capture in the overland transport that by 1680 had been going on for decades in her homeland. She had at the very least an inkling of what was happening to her. While she might not have known where she was going to be taken, she knew that she would not return, that she would not see her home again. Having lived in proximity to English slave trading and to the dangers of firepower for decades, might she not have designed to bring an explosive and liberatory end to herself and the people on board that ship? Having experienced firsthand the violence of capture, might she not have anticipated the violence to come and made a strategic decision to bring it to a dramatic end, even as she braced herself with a final draw of sweet tobacco smoke from her pipe. I end each of my narrations of these women's stories with a version of that question, might she not? I ended the first part of this talk with a speculation about the woman in Bologna, that her, gaze conveys, that her gaze conveys a challenge, a challenge to look at her, to meet her eyes and to see what forces collided, to bring her to the studio of an up and coming Italian painter who captured a kind of knowing on her, a knowing that said, look at me and see what brought me here. I asked what Elizabeth Key might've known about the hardening of racial inheritance and her own need to act decisively to protect her born and unborn children. And I asked what the pipe smoking woman from the interior of Ghana knew about her future, what she knew that caused her to bring it all to an explosive end well before the ship um, on board she was captive help, uh, headed out across the ocean. All of these queries are designed to access what Cedric Robinson would have called the origins of the black radical tradition and what I have recently named an early modern black female political economy. I bring a methodological strategy to bear on these women's lives that is both um, rooted in the archive, in the dull reiterative economy of archival research, and that willfully and mindfully reaches out past the light oak tables in the new British library. These women must be at the heart both of social historical investigation, but also at the core of the colonial process of knowledge production that positions, that positions economics as the site of rationality and knowability. In contrast, um, and I'm quoting here the poet Norbise Philip, uh, to the messy effluvia race-making space between the legs of enslaved women who, as a result, produce such epistemological rationality. The process by which accounts of court, trade, commerce, and government came to be archived is the same one that ended with no accounting at all for the lived experiences of Africans as commodities of the lives of 16th and 17th century African women and their descendants. As I said at the onset of this talk, it's impossible to approach the histories of slavery and gender without confronting the problem of the archive. In Marissa Fuentes' powerful terms, quote, enslaved women appear through the form and content of archival documents in the manner in which they lived, spectacularly violated, objectified, disposable, hypersexualized, and silenced. The violence is transferred from the enslaved bodies to the documents that count, condemn, assess, and evoke them, and we receive them in that condition. That condition has largely been one in which black women are counted and then condemned to be nothing other than figures on slave traders ledgers or assets in a slave traders will. Captured by the Atlantic market through a set of ideas and practices that not only enabled the damage white people did to them, but also ensured that such damage could only result in archival obscurity. If the archives make it impossible to receive African women as other than historically obscure, damaged, and violated, then redressing that damage requires a clear understanding of that which situated them as such. Sometimes it is as spectacular as an exploding slave ship. 
but more often the impact of that violence can only be found in the curl of the lip or the claim that one's freedom comes to you through a white father. The manifestations of racial hierarchy are inescapably violent, but they gestate in the claims of neutrality, calculability, and rationality. The practices that locate trade as rational and black women as entry marks on ledgers, transformed from subjects to objects of trade through concepts of population, value, market, currency, and worth. So much has been lost to the pages of legislative debates, merchants' ledgers, calculations of risk, finance, fluctuating values, tariffs, production and trade. The archives of gender and slavery emerge in a maddening synchronicity of erasure and enumeration. Elizabeth Key and the other women with whom I am concerned did, however, generate intellectual and political responses to the profoundly new circumstances that were unfolding around them. As I continue to strive to understand some of the depths of what Hortense Spillers laid out so brilliantly when she mobilized the notion that enslaved women were forced to reproduce kinlessness, we need to reflect on how those women accounted for the destruction of their kin ties and the financial claims laid upon their bodies. A woman who sees commodification's logic reach into her womb anticipates real economic violence. Her response to that has to be part of our arsenals as we attempt the urgent work of renaming and reordering the histories that have brought us here. The work of excavating the history of the Black Atlantic, the categories it produced, the violent destructions it wrought, requires a breadth of approaches united by a political and ethical stance towards academic practices that is capacious and omnivorous. And I see that mobilized in the Black feminist feminist practices that have shaped my work since I was an undergraduate, reading Audre Lorde and imagining that, doing, that the doing of Black women's history might prove to be a way to save us. Today, I think alongside Ruha Benjamin, who asks, quote, is it any wonder that Black people whose meta kinship threatens the biological myth of white supremacy have had to innovate bonds that can withstand the many forms of bondage that attempted to suffocate Black life? Cultivating kinfulness is cultivating life, close quote. I believe that all manner of questions and answers are revealed when we center the lives of African women and their descendants. Race, economy, value, and sociality emerged and thus must be examined in proximity to one another. We have heard over the past two days brilliant critiques of the rationalizing precepts of quantitative methods and evidence of the stranglehold of colonialism on, a, on the epistemologies of science, gender, and race. From the floor, we heard questions about the road forward. What do we need to do and think differently to change this disastrous trajectory? This morning, this, the, fem, the massive feminist strike offers a tangible roadmap for change, um, a space of new knowledge production. I'm not able to give you a better way, but also I need to ask, what are the possibilities of thought, of transforming thought into action, into refusal, into kin making? Discerning the contours of those lives from the fragments of the archives is challenging. It requires a methodological and political stance in which a painting provokes a legal claim and a lit pipe looks like a revolution and all of it makes kin within and across time. Woven together, these archival fragments, sutured with a microdose of Hartman's critical fabulation, bring me closer to the reckoning that I believe we must complete as we attempt to navigate the afterlives of slavery and the weighty violences of racial capitalism. Thank you.